Okay, it is now five past. Um, so I suggest we start. Um, good morning, everyone, and hello to all of you joining online, wherever you might be joining from. Um, my name is Dan Apple, and um, I'm logging in from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I have Dr. Brian Whedon um, here with me, joining from DC, Washington, DC. Um, this is the first of two talks um, on space programs in emerging space nations. Um, a little bit of a background. The intention of these two presentations um, is for us to present, I wouldn't say a blueprint, rather than one possible method or one possible approach to address space strategies and space programs in emerging space nations. This is the first of these two talks where we discuss with Dr. Brian Whedon um, a little bit about the, the current background or current situation and context in uh, the global space industry, or I should say global space ecosystem. And then I will talk a bit about my experiences working uh, with a brilliant team in Hungary um, on Hungary's national space strategy, which was adopted in September 2021, uh, where we started work in 2020 uh, May. And then I will try to do so, uh, presenting all of this work through the lens of systems engineering referring to certain systems engineering methods and systems architecting methods and how some of these were employed um, during the development of the Hungarian National Space Strategy. Um, and with that, I would like to say a little bit about myself. So I'm a research assistant at the moment at MIT Aeroastro, and I'm also um, a master's candidate in another program called Technology and Policy. I started at MIT in 2019. Prior to that, I was um, I studied um, space engineering, space systems engineering at Cranfield University in the United Kingdom, and I have uh, my undergraduate degree completed in mechanical engineering. I worked before arriving to MIT um, for about five six years um, in the aerospace industry, initially working as a turbo machine design engineer, and then working for roughly five years as an uh, uh, as a spacecraft thermal engineer at Airbus Defence and Space in the UK. Um, I've worked on a range of missions. I had the privilege to work on the European Mars rover mission, ExoMars, uh, which hopefully will be launching later this year. And I have also worked on a range of geostationary telecommunication missions, uh, being the lead thermal engineer for the payload on two of these and supporting a range of others. I also have experience working on CubeSats and small satellites. And my research at the moment focuses primarily on small satellite systems engineering, modular engineering and platform optimization, as well as various policy questions, space policy questions um, associated with, with the small satellite ecosystem. Um, and with that, I would ask Dr. Whedon to introduce himself. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so my name is Brian Whedon. I'm the director of program planning with the Skirrell Foundation. Uh, my background, I started out uh, electrical engineering, ROTC, went into the Air Force, did space missile operations for the better part of nine years. Uh, and then since then, I've been working primarily for Secure World. Uh, our focus is the long-term sustainable use of space for benefits on Earth. Uh, and within that, my research focuses a lot on orbital debris, space situation awareness, space traffic management, sustainability, security, and a whole host of other space governance challenges. Um, and relevant to today's talk, We've been participating in uh, the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which we've seen grow to 100 countries over the last 10 years. And, and along the way, a lot of those countries are trying to figure out what their national policies, strategies are to address not only what, how they want to engage in the space world and become spacefaring themselves, but also deal with a whole bunch of challenges uh, that we're going to talk about in a minute. So, um, you know, when Daniel approached me about this, I was more than happy to contribute sort of what I've been seeing happening and sort of how we see things from our, our perspective. Thanks, Dr. Whedon. A little bit about the logistics um, as of, uh, uh, in terms of today's thought. So in the, the structure is going to be uh, a keen or, or similar to a, a funneling down structure going from a broader context. Um, um, I'm really happy that Dr. Whedon is here with us and can introduce or, or talk about the global context of both the space industry and the ecosystem and also 
um, the policy um, aspect of this. So after he's done that, he's also going to talk about what sort of challenges are faced, not just by new actors, um, emerging space actors, but also incumbent actors in the space industry. Um, then along that, well, with that, he's also going to talk about more of the international policy context for emerging space nations. So how this current situation and various challenges impact new actors joining this domain. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the background, or I, I should say the theoretical side of um, what it is uh, that um, affects an emerging space nation joining and what sort of possible approaches, strategies, and motivations they might have. And then I'm going to introduce a range of, um, I'm, I'm going to try to keep it light, but a range of theoretical um, ideas or, or concepts around system dynamics and systems engineering, which I have tried to employ, or at least uh, keep in mind as we work the strategy. And then using these, I'm going to address certain questions and different parts of the, the, the strategy writing process. So as I said, um, the first part of this um, lecture or talk is going to be given by Dr. Whedon. And with that, I would like to ask you um, if you could start with your class. Thank you. Sure, happy to do so. So we're going to open up just by going through sort of why space is important, sort of the some of the some of the some of the ways it changes our daily lives, and and hopefully some of this is 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 a little bit different than what you might hear through some of the more space focused sources. Um, next slide, please. So we space is everywhere in our daily lives whether we notice it or not uh, the term i've used in the past is somewhat in, invisible infrastructure uh, for a lot of things um, and and in some cases it just may be so prevalent that we just don't really understand it um, so for example this is a shot uh, from from somewhere in india showing all these satellite dishes uh, that are are used for as i understand it for micro payments uh, sort of like payment transactions, right? They're they're there to make connections from all these little stores that connect up to these things. Um, you can also see these everywhere for television, right? For receiving television signals. We just sort of take it for granted that, okay, of course I can put a satellite dish up and get connection to somewhere else in the world. Next slide. Um, weather is another huge, huge area that uh, that space plays a role in. Uh, people see the weather on the local forecasts. Uh, I'm not sure they really re recognize how much of the underlying data is coming from satellites, uh, particularly when it comes to major disasters and, and warning of potential major severe weather and disasters. Uh, this is a, an image of Hurricane Ida uh, that struck the southeastern U.S. Uh, in the middle of 2021, uh, taken from a GO satellite, which is located in geostationary orbit. And there are several of these satellites parked around geostationary orbit that provide this sort of coverage over the entire earth um, big picture kind of warning and detection of events as opposed to the much much narrower you might get from your you know, local local tv stations uh radar images next um, this is an image of uh global shipping fleets that are being monitored by a nonprofit uh, organization called Global Fishing Watch. Um, and what's interesting is they're using space data to detect whether or not uh, fishing vessels are breaking the law. They compare uh, um, two, a couple different sources. One is most vessels over a certain size are supposed to broadcast their location via a satellite service called, uh, and, um, and, and most do, but then sometimes they turn that off, especially when they want to go in a place we're not supposed to be. Well, when you combine the, that location transmission with optical and radar imagery that can actually count how many vessels are in an area, you can see which vessels in a certain location are broadcasting and which are not, and you can figure out where they are. Um, and, and this NGO uses all that space-based data to monitor for illegal fishing um, and provide data to government to say, hey, did you know these ships were in your area fishing without permission or illegally? Next. 
Um, more on the human side, uh, this is a satellite image of human trafficking, uh, as in humans that are in, in, you know, literally modern day slaves being transshipped in the Pacific. Uh, and this is another application from NGOs that are using publicly available space-based data to try and track down some of these uh, networks and, and you know, d d tackle what is a severe humanitarian challenge. Next. Um, more broadly, we have the 17 sustainable development goals that United Nations is, is working towards. You can go through pretty much every single one of these and find a role where space data, space services uh, are, 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 are part of the solution. They're part of either monitoring, they're part of detection, or they're part of actually combating the solution. Um, and, and I think it's important to keep that in mind because we sometimes in the space world think about space as, you know, sending astronauts places and exploring planets and, you know, discovering new things in the star, but there's a ton of really important applications right here on Earth. And to be honest, this is what motivates countries um, as much or more so than some of the things that we do in space itself. Next slide. So when we talk about the space industry, a couple of things to keep in mind is sort of the different components and parts of it. Um, these are numbers from last year. The entire global space economy, uh, roughly 371 billion US dollars. Uh, interesting that you know, 100 billion of that's so roughly one third are government space budgets for things like military space activities, human space flight, exploration, science. Uh, about 117 of it is uh, called satellite services. And of that, more than 100 billion is television. Television, you know, communicate broadcast communications. Um, and then we have another 135 billion is spent here on the ground. It's things like uh, consumer equipment, those satellite TV dishes, uh, satellite radio, broadband, um, GPS receivers, gateways, antennas, all the stuff that makes everything connect and, and go together. Um, so, you know, the space industry is pretty small. Uh, I think that, you know, you compare this to the revenues of companies like Walmart or Apple or Amazon, uh, it's smaller than those companies' annual revenues, uh, but it has a, a pretty huge outsized impact beyond that. Next slide. So the next piece is that's sort of a broad overview of the, what the space industry is and, and impacts. I just want to look at some of the trends that are happening now, particularly the growing number of actors in space to, and, and some of the challenges that is presenting. Next slide. So at the moment, there are, oh, I forgot to put that, that big one up there, but uh, there's a little more than 5,000 active satellites in orbit. Um, and that's a pretty huge change just in the last few years, so we'll talk about in a minute. Um, about 2,800 of those are, are US satellites, either US government or US flagged companies. Um, see Russia, 167, China, about 431, everyone else, roughly 1,100. Um, those active satellites are up there floating around with a whole bunch of orbital debris. If we look at debris bigger than 10 centimeters, there's roughly 36,000 of those up there. So already way outweighing the numbers of actual satellites. Um, and, and larger than 10 centimeters means it can set range in size from a softball to the school bus. So pretty huge range of sizes. But if we look smaller than that, between one and 10 centimeters, there's roughly a million objects. And if we look at smaller than one centimeter, many, many millions of objects that we just sort of kind of know are there whizzing around uh, but, but we just, you know, don't have a great understanding of, of, of where they are, no real ability to track them. And all of those different sizes of the debris can cause anywhere from catastrophic collisions to major and minor damage to all those functional satellites. Next slide. These numbers have been accelerating. The, on the left, you see this is the population of objects in orbit. Over time, in the middle, you see tonnage. So it's mass of objects in orbit over time. And on the right, you see payloads, right? So number of active satellites in orbit. And that's where we've really seen that huge increase. Um, 10 years ago, there were a little more than 1,000. 
now we're up to uh you know we're blown past four and a half thousand over five thousand and there's and it's going to get even more crazy so with all these new actors new interest new uh interest in doing stuff in space from companies from governments we're seeing accelerating in new satellites which is being thrown on top of all the existing debris um, and is one of the major challenges next and this is just tip of the iceberg um, these are a sampling of some of the major constellations mostly commercial but not always that are being planned for launch over the next 10 years uh, totaling somewhere around 50 to 100,000 new satellites um, that are currently planned for launch. Um, some of these are, are, are more real than others. So for example, Starlink Gen 1, uh, they plan 4,400. They've got 2,000 of those launched. So more than halfway there to that first goal, um, but they plan a second constellation of 30,000 satellites. Um, OneWeb has got about 400 of their planned 6,300. Um, and they have notions for another 47,000, which is a little interesting. Um, and it's multiple countries. You've got UK, US, Canada, China, all with these plans on the books. Uh, and just announcement from the European Union that they're going to unveil their plans some point in the next week or so. Next slide. Reminder that we, you know, satellites have to talk to each other and talk to the ground. And the primary way we do that is through radio frequencies. Um, this is a snapshot of the current international allocations between uh, 35 and 51 gigahertz. Um, all these different colors represent different types of applications, both space and terrestrial applications. Um, and, and the point here is we think a lot about orbital debris and physical congestion, the radio frequency spectrum congestion is just as big a concern and, and how we manage to operate multiple services, not only in space, but also terrestrial and between space and terrestrial that all are using similar or same frequencies is a really, really, really big challenge. Next slide. Um, and on top of this, we have a whole bunch of national security and potential military threats. I think a lot of people have heard recently um, a lot of growing concerns about potential conflict on Earth that can extend into space and recent examples of anti satellite testing uh, by Russia and, uh, and India and in the last going back a decade or so, you know, China and the United States. There are a growing number of countries that are looking at how do we protect and defend our own satellites and how do we potentially interfere to degrade destroy somebody else's satellites uh, i'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on that the link at the bottom here goes to a report that my organization puts out every year um, that sort of goes into all the greedy details on this but you know in addition to all the commercial and civil uses there's a lot of activity and growth in in the national security uses of space that has its own set of challenges to think about. Next slide. So in addition to all of the stuff I just talked about, which is happening in Earth orbit, there's now a growing interest in extending space activities out beyond Earth to the moon, Mars, other places. Um, this is a snapshot of just exploration missions uh, so things related to human spaceflight and, and civil science that was compiled by Bryce uh, uh, middle of uh, 2020. Um, you can see that at the time they estimated there were about 150 planned uh, crew and cargo missions to low Earth orbit, uh, largely supporting the International Space Station and the new Chinese Space Station. But on top of that, they looked at 95 plans, planned missions to the moon from the US, Russia and China but also a whole host of other countries and commercial companies. Um, and of course, plans for even going beyond that back to the Mars. So we need to think about not only what are the, the sustainability challenges here on Earth orbit, but also now extending into lunar orbit and beyond. Next slide. Um, this is a snapshot. I mentioned the, this UN Committee on Peaceful Outer Space. Uh, this is a snapshot of the current 
uh, membership of that committee. And the countries that are in bold are the ones that have joined in the last year. So this list includes the countries you would expect to be interested in space, United States, France, China, Russia, Israel, India, a bunch of others. But it also includes a whole bunch of countries that uh, I'm sure not everyone really knew were interested in space and wanted to have space programs. All of these countries are trying to sort out and figure out what are their interests in space? How are they approaching it from a national policy and strategy perspective? What sort of things do they want to do in space? Um, and then what is their role in addressing some of those challenges I was just talking about? Next slide. So these are the kinds of questions that we, the space community, are grappling with. Will all of these new actors coming into the space world, commercial and governmental, launching satellites, operating constellations, will they all have the same learning curve as the legacy actors? Are they going to make all the same mistakes all over again, or are they going to make a whole bunch of new mistakes? How are these countries going to develop national space policy and law, and, and why are they going to do it? What are the considerations? Um, and then the bigger question, particularly thinking about the long-term sustainability space, which is a, fo a focus for my organization, how do we help maximize the benefits we're going to get, the innovation, the new services, the new data, the broader application of space benefits from these new actors while minimizing the potential sustainability challenges from physical congestion, radio frequency congestion, collisions, um, potential conflicts, erupting into space. These are really, really big questions that I know my organization is grappling with and the entire space community is trying to understand. Next slide. Uh, before I stop my piece here, I'll just put a plug in here for a product that my organization published about five years ago called the Handbook for New Actors in Space. Um, and the purpose of this was to try and help address those exact questions. Um, this is a relatively short publication that provides a broad overview of the international framework for space, national policies, regulatory frameworks, and then space operations. How do you operate your spacecraft in a, in a sustainable manner? Um, we've handed out several thousand copies uh, over the last five years, had a lot of interest. We've recently had it translated into French, Spanish, and Chinese. Um, those editions, as well as the the original are available on our website. Um, and we're actually in the midst right now of planning an update that will be out in the next year or so. Um, so again, this is sort of our, in, our, our intent to try and help answer some of those questions. So I think that is my last slide. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Daniel. Thank you, Dr. Weed. So, over the next, um, I should say, roughly an hour, I'm going to talk about emerging space nations and um, particularly Hungary in space. And um, I would like to emphasize at the start that, as opposed to the brilliant book that um, the Pure World Foundation has um, issued or uh, published recently, this is, I, I wouldn't recommend using this as a blueprint or even a handbook uh, for approaching these strategies. And I also need to emphasize that I'm not here officially on behalf of. Um, the Hungarian um, government, uh, I'm merely representing the approach that I have used working as the lead technical expert on developing this, this um, space strategy. So this is more an approach. This is a lens I have used um, as we viewed the strategy creation process, which I have returned to over and over again. Some of it may be um, entirely trivial for a lot of people and, and intuitive, but I feel that using this systems engineering approach does help to structure things and also does help to keep certain things in, a, in check and, and relate to other parts and find the interfaces. So, you know, before I get on to what the strategy was or how we, we went through the, the, the strategy writing process, I wanted to address um, the eternal question, um, is, which is why do we go to space? And more importantly, why does an emerging space nation, which I would say a lot of people uh, would define in some ways as a developing country that is hoping to um, somehow get more involved in the space industry, in the space ecosystem, 
And in a lot of the cases, not in all of them, but in a lot of the cases, this means that this is a country, country with more limited resources than either of the incumbent large spacefaring nations. So certainly, you know, if we look at the European Space Agency's budget, which is roughly around 6 billion euros, and we look at NASA's budget, uh, which I, if I remember correctly, is at the order of magnitude or the order of magnitude of 20 billion dollars. Um, most of these countries don't have these resources. And in some of the cases, the question arises, why are they spending on this rather than something else? So this is this could be described as a guns or butter question. Why are these countries not spending more on feeding or educating their people? Why are they spending on, on technological development? But I see this as a false dichotomy. The reason for that being is that if you look at the, the diagram or, or graph on the left-hand side, which is from Alice Emerson's, Alice Emerson's brilliant book, The Rise of the Rest, which talks about emerging nations and how they latecomers joining uh, different industries, you can see that there are two ways to reduce unique labor costs. One is dropping wages, so moving down to point B from point A. The other one is increasing productivity. Now, dropping real wages will happen eventually, naturally, so for that, the nation doesn't have to do much. They simply uh, need to stop or not work on, on developing pro productivity, and then eventually they will be unable to co uh, compete with import products and wages will drop. However, obviously, if you work on the productivity improvement, that creates a sustainable path as opposed to real wages dropping, because eventually, as um, larger nations or more developed nations develop their uh, productivity, those wages will drop to an unsustainable level. And the other, the, the middle graph is, and I do appreciate that it's a little bit difficult to see, is one of my favorite ones. A lot of people don't fully appreciate the, the magnitude or the importance of what um, a successful space program can mean for the entirety of the country. Now, admittedly, this is the NASA Apollo mission, so the largest space mission or space program in human history. But you can see that the first um, curve peaking, which is the increase in uh, NASA budget, uh, was immediately, for almost immediately, with a certain amount of lag, was followed by a massive increase in various types of STEM, STEM PhD or advanced or higher degrees in physical sciences, engineering, and mathematical sciences. And this led to an overall um, in improvement or increase in sustainability in, in the different technological fields in the United States. Um, and obviously this has a knock-on effect on a range of industries and the general socioeconomic prosperity of the country. On the right-hand side, um, this is to represent that as a society, we're becoming more and more data hungry. I don't think anybody will question this. So in a sense, data and obtaining data and ob obtaining timely and more comprehensive data is becoming a necessity for every country that wants to succeed socioeconomically and prosper. So you don't really have an option not to participate in one of the main avenues or one of the main ways of generating this sort of data, whether that's communications data or earth observation data. And you don't want to be someone, you don't want to be a, a nation or a space sector who eventually will be entirely reliant on external sources. It's the same way as, as importing gas or importing any sort of natural resources. You don't want to be vulnerable and um, exposed to fluctuations in the cost or, or um, availability of those resources. And our society relies on the equivalent of crude oil in the form of data and will rely on it more and more over the coming decades and centuries. But really why, what's the, if we wanted to characterize and, and properly detail the different um, reasons why, why emerging space sectors join the space industry, what are these? Um, there are survival tips for humanity from Carl Sagan's brilliant book, A Pale Blue Dot, which um, obviously space industry leaders, such as Mr. Musk, often quote themselves as well. In this, um, Carl Sagan says that we cannot be a one planet species for us to survive in the long term. And in many ways, this survival um, necessity or necessity to participate in spacefaring or space travel applies to emerging nations as well in an international context. You do need to be part of this. This is the next logical step in national sovereignty and working towards 
um, the survival or, or prosperity, long-term sustainability of your nation. Um, but also the other reason for, for almost have, not having a choice um, in terms of uh, whether you participate in the space industry is that you as a nation or, or uh, as an individual as well, you're already part of a human society and, and, and a planet which has extended into outer space. You don't have a choice of not being part of it, whether you accept it or know it or you don't. And a rude awakening or somewhat of a reminder of this was um, the Bogota Convention, which was a declaration issued by seven equatorial countries, if I remember correctly, in the 1970s. And one of the few instances when uh, the, uh, the Outer Space Treaty was contested and, um, and um, participant nations tried to change it, in this declaration's equatorial nations, claimed that the way how geostationary positions, geostationary orbital positions were allocated was unfair and, and not legitimate. And they wanted to retain the right to operate geostationary satellites above in the space, um, airspace or extended airspace above their nations. Now, this didn't succeed, but you can see that at that point, there was already an existing system or, or developing system for geostationary a critical resource, geostationary orbital positions, and it happened without them knowing or acknowledging it. Um, the other reason is, is not just survival, it's also recognizing that there is an opportunity today, especially, and over the past ten, five, ten years, that these nations, nations need to seize. I've mentioned earlier the rise of the rest, and yes, you could think of emerging nations joining this industry as latecomers, and in certain um, rules around technology transfer and, and late development apply to them. But you could also think of this more as the equivalent of North, uh, North American countries joining the second industrial Revo revolution and, and not being latecomers, but rather using new technologies and in some sense leapfrogging and jumping ahead. If we think of the current um, context or the current new paradigm shifts from oil space to new space uh, and various developments in the space eco economy and ecosystem, we could construe this or think of this in some sense as a fifth industrial revolution. Some might contest it, I recognize that. But yes, over the next five, 10 years, uh, one or two decades, our um, presence in space and how this impacts is going to change and it's going to grow exponentially. Now, humans kind of often struggle to grasp what ex exponential means. But even if you just think of the number of the growth of satellites that Dr. Whedon has mentioned, you can see an exponential trend. So there is an opportunity and there is a moment that these countries, many of them recognize, so did Hungary as well, um, and need to seize, need to join now. If you want to articulate these more uh, in a structured way, we could use the framework from Joseph Nye and you could see space power as uh, in the context of different types of power, military power, such as national security, cooperation with other nations, uh, sovereignty. You could see it as a form of economic power. As I mentioned, as Dr. Whedon has um, elucidated earlier, there are clear socioeconomic benefits to space technology, and it is become, becoming and has become ubiquitous and omnipresent in our lives. Obviously, if you improve this, you improve all of the industries reliant on space technology. There's also long-term sustainability in many different ways. And I don't just mean the survival that I described earlier, but also many of these countries need to prevent brain drain. You cannot focus on low added value industries because over time, any talent that you educate yourself may leave your country to join technology industries abroad. And it is really difficult to retain or attract them back. One way to do this is to develop your industry or presence in an industry as advanced as space technology or the space domain. So lots of countries actually have um, endeavors to build up their own space, space ecosystem to retain talent. Uh, Romania, for example, has unofficially and in interviews uh, or certain leaders in the space domain has articulated this before. And also it is part of soft power. You can see this in the context of soft power. And that's not something to underestimate. I have shown that graph earlier of how um, space technology and different large space projects impact um, the, um, the the education in, in these nations and in impact long-term development. There is prestige in, in participating in space and prestige both externally, but also internally. You show to other nations, your nation 
uh, or you as a space actor show to others that you're capable of doing this. But you're also showing this internally to your own citizens, to your own society, that you um, citizens are able to do this. And then lastly, there isn't just an impetus on emerging space actors to join themselves. There is also an impetus, there is also a motivation for larger incumbent space actors to allow and help uh, these, what you could refer to as the rest in the space context to, to join and, and grow because you do want a robust space market. And what is good for the rest is also good for the West. You do want more innovation from these, uh, these regions. You do want a more reliable and, um, and more robust space market. And so technology transfer is not a one directional thing. Now, moving on, what is emerging from where? Uh, I love this um, matrix from ESPI, uh, the space power matrix as they refer to it. Um, I hope it is visible, um, um, or this slide is visible on the left as well. You could class the different emerging space nations um, and obviously incumbent large space faring nations as well, based on their um, capacity and autonomy, based on their space manufacturing capabilities and their autonomy, how um, self-sustaining or how self-contained their um, space industry is. Now, obviously the largest space nations, the US, Russia, China would be in the top right corner. Um, and many of the emerging or all of the emerging space, space nations would be somewhere along these um, two axes or positioned in this um, matrix. And obviously they want to move ahead towards becoming either more autonomous, developing further capacities or capabilities, or both at the same time and working towards becoming a true space power. Now, certainly I, I wouldn't want to class or wouldn't be able to position Hungary exactly where it was before we started this technology or the strategy writing process. But certainly the aim was to de develop or improve both the autonomy and make the space sector in Hungary sustainable and self-contained and also to improve capacity. How do things emerge? How does this emergence or how does this growth happen? Um, Dr. Daniel Wood, who is one of the foremost experts of um, emerging, space emerging space nations or, or uh, space technology in emerging space nations, and also how you can use space technology to advance social justice. Has done a lot of work in this domain, and I have borrowed this uh, graph originally uh, created by Otterbeck and Kim uh, from one of their papers with uh, Dr. Annalisa Wegel. Um, this shows the difference in terms of the developmental trajectory between incumbents or large spacefaring nations who started usually by developing missile technology. Or, or their defense domain. And from that, they developed a more advanced civilian use of space technology. This is different for latecomers. Oftentimes they do have processes that they can adapt themselves, addressing also challenges that they see then. And then from that, they develop their product. So you can see that there is a difference in the cadence. There is a difference in the, in the rhythm of how um, the space domain develops in these uh, emerging space countries. Now, there are different, um, there are different trajectories for these emerging space nations as well. Again, from another paper from Dr. Wood and Wegel, um, there is another, there are two trajectories or three trajectories presented here for different nations um, in, a, in a framework that um, Dr. Wood has worked on, uh, referred to as the um, uh, space technology ladder. So you can go from creating a space agency to um, commissioning or building a, a low earth orbit satellite, then to building a geostationary satellite, and launching that, so potentially developing your launch cap capabilities. Now, this some nations might not do in this uh, linear, uh, or linear way, or they might not do in, in this order. You can see that some of them actually do something, and hence the, the lovely little frog on the right hand side, some of them do this in something which we refer to as leapfrogging. So, jumping certain um, steps, jumping over certain steps, and directly moving on to a more advanced technology, skipping steps, what the larger spacefaring nations who sort of develop this more organically over decades and decades have gone through. They don't need to do that because the processes already exist. So let me, let's move on to Hungary and, and why has Hungary uh, ventured or, or, or engaged more in, in, in space technology and, and why they have decided to, to participate more intensely um, in, in the space industry. 
Now, I'm hoping that all of you have joined at least know a little bit about Hungary and know at least where it is. It's a landlocked, relatively small nation. Um, I was fortunate to be, be born there. My family is still there. And um, yeah, I mean, it is a small nation, but in many ways, it's, it's a nation with a really rich history, certainly really rich, rich history in sciences. Um, in its size, in terms of its size, I would compare it to perhaps Portugal or Indiana for my colleagues and friends from the US. It's 100,000 kilometers squared, kilometer, uh, kilometer squared. And in terms of its population, it's 10 million people with a GDP per capita somewhere between Spain and Malaysia. I wouldn't want to give an exact number. Obviously, it depends whether that's nominal purchase power parity. But certainly not one of the richest countries in the world, but also not a poor country and a country with centuries, centuries of scientific development. And there is a lot of heritage in, for, especially for a small nation in the space technology or space domain as well. Hungary launched the seventh astronauts in the world. Uh, Bertel and Farkas on the right hand side flew in 1980 through the intercosmos, the Soviet intercosmos project. Also Zoltan Bay, um, a physicist, was the second uh, leader of the second group who bounced off radar waves uh, from the moon of the moon's surface in 1946. And there are lots of space patents. There, there has been a lot of work done in, in, in space research. Hungary has collaborated with the, some of the largest nations um, in, in various large space projects um, over the, the past decade. In terms of the international context, and what one of the things that motivated Hungary was to um, was seeing that some of its neighbors have also started working more intensely on their own space strategies. Now, you know, it, it, it was a recognition that it is a time to join this or be more involved in this. And it also was a time when others, others in, in similar um, emerging space sectors or nation nations, others in its vicinity have also developed. So this created opportunities to create their own space um, strategy. The other reason was that, as I said, there is a long heritage of um, Hungary working with, with some of the, um, the, the largest space nations, the space faring nations, and working on different space projects. Hungary has been uh, an ESA, a cooperating state uh, working with the European Space Agency since 1991. So three decades now, and it has joined as a full member in 2015. Now, this comes with certain obligations. So certainly there was also an international context and some amount of pressure to develop a centralized strategy. You do need this when you work with larger nations and when you work on these large uh, projects, which all require international collaboration and it, it require uh, um, memorandum of, of understandings and, and different types of contracts and bilateral agreements, multilateral agreements with the largest nations, you do need a central strategy to do so. So to go back to the, the, the reasons I presented previously, Hungary recognized that there is a momentous change afoot. There is a paradigm shift in the space industry at the moment, and they wanted to seize this opportunity. They did realize that in order for the country to prosper over the coming decades, they do need to develop um, a deep tech or, or hard tech industry and technology industry, which helps to develop and retain talent, and also um, to, to have an impact. So the space, space domain allowed them or will, will allow them to have an impact on a range of other technology sectors. Obviously, there are a range, there's a range of other reasons in almost all of the different uh, definitions or, or contexts of power, of how space power relates to um, national power or state power. Certainly, national security was uh, one of the motivating factors. Socioeconomic benefits, Hungary is um, in many ways an agricultural nation or, or, or a country that has a strong ag agricultural domain. Uh, many of you will know that precision agriculture today relies heavily and will rely even more so over the coming decades on Earth observation data. You almost cannot have and will not be able to have a prosperous and well-functioning agricultural sector without Earth observation data, certainly. And it's also for urban development and a range of other things um, which will help the nation to prosper over the coming decades. Now, Evidently, soft power is also critical. Hungary is part of the European Union, but it also works with nations around the world, um, has many, many allies and many, many um, uh, collaborating countries in different projects. Pre the prestige that space power of becoming a space power or a space, an emerging space sector with a stronger uh, 
um, presence in, in the space industry certainly provides many other external benefits as well in terms of soft power. And has Hungary ever since, it, even though it has been collaborating with other nations as well, but ever since it has um, started on the path of developing its own strategy, has been doing this significantly more in intensely and on an entirely different level, collaborating with some of the, the largest international companies and some of the, the largest um, countries um, in, in, in the domain of, of space technology. So now moving on to how we've actually developed the space strategy and how we viewed this. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the lens through which I saw the space sector, the lens through which I, I try to understand the dynamic dynamics of it to be able to create a solution, an architecture that will address problems and that will help um, Hungary to, to prosper in this domain. Now, system dynamics is just one approach to understand how complex system works, how um, uh, nonlinear systems work or function uh, due to um, feedback processes in a complex system. It helps us to understand how certain processes, how certain organizations function using um, stocks and flows from, from one stock to the other uh, and feedback loops to describe this complexity. It was a method originally developed by Jay Forrester at MIT and is extensively used in, in, in business. And certainly you can use it quantitatively, but even the modeling process, even creating certain simple models, causal loop diagrams, help us to understand feedback processes and connections between different uh, parts of a system. So in this case, I, I, I borrowed one of the simplest models that's used uh, in understanding epidemics or epidemiology and also understanding technology diffusion. This is referred to as the bus or base uh, diffusion model. And it shows how from potential adopters, one becomes an adopter of a technology. And it shows what sort of factors influence those and what sort of stocks uh, and uh, flows you have in this system. So without getting too much into detail, what I try to highlight this is that if we think of space technology or, or any type of technology that we're trying to um, spread or use in a country, a government has the ability through central coordination to, to affect many elements or factors, key factors of this adoption process. Um, you can affect advertising effectiveness, awareness, raise awareness. You can affect contact rate, bring different actors closer to, together and, and boost this um, adoption process. These are simpler um, models, as in, in the sense that they, they only depict um, the different types of feedback processes. They don't rely on, on also showing stocks and variables more explicitly. But these are also models which help us uh, from, from where we're not so back, which help us to understand how innovation works and how certain processes around innovation function um, in different industries. On the left, you can see how the number of firms in a, in a certain market is influenced by a range of other factors which are also, are, are also interconnected. And certainly if I'm a governmental actor and I'm trying to um, address um, the problem of wanting to develop and grow a space ecosystem, I need to understand these feedback processes. I need to understand what are the key things that I need to uh, first and foremost strengthen because those have a knock-on effect on other things in, 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 in the global and local ecosystem as well. So for example, race of innovation, you can change with certain grants. Um, intensity of competition, you can also affect by helping or subsidizing certain companies. Availability of financing is obviously a critical thing that any government can do. On the right-hand side, again, going back to this technology adoption or, or diffusion, there's another model where you can see that the number of users, if you introduce governmental users, if you create a demand for space technologies, you can impact the growth of the space industry. That's, that's fairly trivial, but it's important to understand these feedback processes. Equally, emergence of standards. If you're a governmental actor, and this is one of the key ways of creating um, or helping technology transfer, you're able to influence and create standards. And then again, potential users can be um, um, influenced or, or uh, uh, ameliorated or grown by, by helping raise, to raise awareness. I've adopted this and I do apologize to um, people who specialize in system dynamics and are here with us. Uh, it, it may not be the, the best or most perfect model of the satellite industry, but I try to depict 
how different things in the satellite industry or the space economy are interconnected. And you can see that governmental support, at least in this really simple causal loop diagram, impacts a lot of different things. Um, you know, they do have control over research institutions, they do have control over many different things, and certainly they're linked to international com competition in space, support for space but science helps, governmental um, support grow, and you can see that there is there are many links, dynamic loops or, or feedback loops in this system, which the governmental actor understanding or the central, uh, the creator of the space strategy understanding can create a more effective strategy. And then finally, this is a, a somewhat more complex model where I'm trying to show that if you're able to influence different type, different domains or segments of the space industry, upstream, downstream, and space-derived activities, you can create a multiplier effect. This is again important for a governmental actor to understand that you there are certain things that you need to do simultaneously in a coordinated manner to help to grow and make this industry sustainable and self-sustaining. But this was only a steady state or snapshot view of your system. The problem is that things happen on a timeline, things happen in, 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 in a temporal sense as well. So I've also introduced or brought in concepts from technology road mapping. You need to understand that almost although governmental strategies are different in many ways to corporate strategies, one of the key things is that you do need to be more, much more ready to change them on a whim because it does need public support. It does need the buy-in of many different types of, of stakeholders who themselves need the support of, for example, their own electorate. So it's not entirely like a corporate strategy, but you will see that public agencies in the US themselves have these two type of technology roadmaps. This allows you to see how the market is changing over time, how different businesses need to um, or, or, or uh, change with that as well. How you need to improve certain products which require you to develop certain services, which requires you to create certain systems, technologies, and support the development of certain sciences. So you do need um, a temporal understanding as well of how things will change over time and combine this with the understanding of how this is a complex nonlinear system. So you will see that these sort of roadmaps are used extensively by space, space agencies developing their own space projects a long time. And if you're a space or an emerging space sector, you do want to understand that how your largest um, stakeholders, such as the European Space Agency in the case of Hungary, is trying to develop its space strategy over time and what sort of roadmap it has for itself. And you need to align your own space strategy with that. So not only you need to understand the dynamics between these different stakeholders you have and different processes, but you also need to understand how these changes over time, because many of these processes are transient. Now, I'm going to move on to how we've actually gone through this process. And again, I would like to emphasize that this is but one way of approaching this. Now, I'm a, a spacecraft thermal engineer and systems engineer by training. So in my understanding of many things, employs or utilizes some sort of systems thinking. And I would like to emphasize the systems thinking is not thinking about things systematically. It's understanding things as an architecture, as a system, and seeing how certain concepts um, present themselves, how there are certain interfaces between, between your, your uh, parts or elements of your architecture, um, and you know what emerges from the form of your system, what sort of function emerges from it. So it's more about understanding um, different processes or different uh, products as a system and, and, and addressing it as such. The question obviously is when you create a strategy like this is how do you create it in a sense that how do you create it in a way that it actually does get employed? So, you know, I've spoken to other people uh, in many ways, I think much more experienced and talented people than myself who have worked in this uh, profession or in this domain working on strategies. One of the key things they say is that your strategy has to be simple. Your strategy can, has to fit into one sentence. You know, in the case of Tesla, for example, they had a really simple strategy mapped out. They wanted to sell initially expensive luxury cars and then use the money from that to create more affordable electric vehicles to allow the diffusion of this technology. Now, the other aspect of this is that as Victor Chang, who gets quoted, I think, in, in pretty much every sort of consultancy training or briefing said, um, a good strategy is only a strategy that, that gets adopted. My favorite analogy for this is that I often think of someone creating a strategy or trying to coordinate an industry like this, consisting of a multitude of different, on different actors, 
um, as a conductor. And if you don't really understand what the conductor is doing, you might think that they're just waving their wand, wand around. And it's really difficult to see how they're actually able to bring together that orchestra or symphonic orchestra together. But they have to, and they do. So well-created strat strategy is like a really good conductor. What was the timeline of creating this strategy before I introduce the actual process? Now, admittedly, um, Hungary has attempted to create a strategy several times prior. And we have, I'm, I'm certain that those um, fantastic um, colleagues of mine, consultants and, and scientists and other people have reused and referenced many of those elements. I would not want to claim that we have started to create the strategy from scratch, scratch in 2020. Certainly that was a time when I joined. And we started off with the same way how you start intuitively almost any sort of um, uh, consultancy project out with the diagnostics and stakeholder mapping. Uh, we, we, we conducted a lot of interviews with scientists, industrial leaders, and then moved on to des design, uh, uh, define designs that we would do. And then actually have done something which was already at this part quite similar to a part of a systems engineering process, decompose this design into different subsystems, and we sl split up the team and split up the work groups based on certain um, industry segments and, and certain elements of the supply chain, and also split it not only horizontally, but also vertically. And then went to create the strategy, um, in, integrated the different parts of the strategy, verified it with the industry leaders and, and stakeholders we have worked, from, worked with from the start, and then handed over this to uh, various policy advisors and governmental ad advisors and actors um, to revise this and, and you know, create a form of this which can be adopted by the government for immediate implementation. And then in 2021, September, it was adopted. It has the implementation of it has started prior to the adoption, but certainly it has officially be, uh, started being implemented from that point onwards. Now, I, I need to uh, put a disclaimer out here. The, the images that I will present here and the process that I'm presenting here is not, they're not images from the final strategy. It has been reworked. It has been, I'm certain, been improved, certainly for governmental use by, by policy advisors uh, from the Hungarian government. But this was the study that we conducted, the strategies that we created with my colleagues between May and 2020 May and 2020 September. So this is when I joined and my immediate thought was, okay, I have, uh, let's say five, five to 10 years experience in systems entry and spacecraft engineering. I have some amount of project management experience, but I don't think many people can claim that they have written national space strategies. I obviously certainly consider myself immensely privileged and I was really grateful to those who have invited me to work on this. And I also had no clue how to start this. So the only thing I could do is to reach to something which I understood better. So I reached to systems engineering. It seemed as something structured, something that is would allow me to approach this problem in a structured manner. So you can see this is a diagram from NASA's uh, acclaimed or, or well-known or renowned um, handbook for systems engineering or systems engineering handbook. And I do apologize if, if it's not really visible in this uh, neon green, but it essentially goes from understanding requirements and stakeholder needs, translating that to some sort of concept and architecture on the left-hand side, and then building up your final product on the right-hand side, going from the bottom up to the top, from design realization, evaluating that design, and then actually transitioning those products and, and making them work and commissioning them. And in the central column, you have the sort of technical management processes which link these two and which um, cut, cut through the different segments or parts of this um, process. Now, another way of seeing this is the traditional V model. Quite similar to the waterfall model, it is one way of approaching systems engineering. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on this. I'm certain that anyone who's worked in some form of systems engineering project management is familiar with this. Basically, it's a V model because it goes from the top uh, needs and requirements being understood um, from the stakeholders and defined, and it flows down to creating a system architecture concept, exploring the trade space for different elements or different uh, solutions for these uh, problems, and then defining your design, iterating on it if you have to, uh, using multidisciplinary optimization and bringing these elements closer to together and improving their interaction. And then after that, integrating your system, managing your interfaces as you need to integrate that. So you might need to iterate several times through this process. And then going up and verifying, validating, and 
and actually, and, and once it is done, permissioning it and using it and then managing it throughout its life cycle. So in a sense, it is going from conceiving something, identifying what values your organization has and what values uh, the, the stakeholders um, espouse or, or prefer, defining a design, uh, reprocessing information and creating something. And then after that, creating the physical product on the right-hand side, or in this case, not a physical product, but the way I thought about it, a strategy being of our product. Now, yes, I understand this is some amount of, there's some amount of shoehorning, but I did think of this as I was writing this, I did think of this as our process initially being, you know, diagnostics and stakeholder mapping, which actually does exist in policy creation as well. So if you read, for example, uh, policy books from Howlett or other people, mapping uh, is, it, is certainly a recurring theme. And it's also there in any, any sort of, um, uh, uh, consultancy project. So we went around, conducted dozens, hundreds of interviews with different actors within the country, with international um, partners, the, the European Space Agency, uh, partners around us, so other nations from the B4, uh, other nations in the Central East European region. We have looked at the different space strategies that our, other countries have employed. And then mapped out the stakeholder needs within the country and you know, check what the industry needs and define requirements based on that. Then we went on to, yeah, sorry. So yeah, as I said, this is an example of what we've done from the actual um, study, what we've used for the space strategy. We have, we have explored what the different stakeholders, some of our future partners, some of our neighbors, um, potentially some of you know, cooperating states or states we might be competing with for different ESA projects have done when they have developed their own space strategy. We have spoken to, to many of the leaders from these states, but also have done the same with industrial leaders. Then we went, through, went on to create some sort of concept or system architecture for the space strategy. Obviously, the actual organization that will, will, will use this or, or function um, as a final product, so the, as we understood the, the National Space Agency, and went through a range of workshops as well. So we invited again stakeholders, and in this case, it kind of became like a living lab. We worked with them to create this product and ask different things from them, what they would prefer, different solutions. It wasn't always that explicit. You know, it wasn't the same as choosing different architectures, actual components for a spacecraft. But in many ways, it was the same sort of trace space exploration or, or concept definition and then trace space exploration. So this is, for example, one type of trace study that we have done to understand what type of national space agencies could work. You could have a space office, you know, it has different costs, different coverage, different way of processing information. You could have uh, a space agency or something in between what, for example, the Czech Republic had. Except, um, Yeah, so we went through this process and then we arrived to the actual strategy creation. Uh, we arrived to, to optimizing how these things are interacting with each other and, and, and understanding interfaces between the different parts of our strategy and also the different parts of how um, Hungary's new space industry is going to function. And then we went on to verify this and validate this with stakeholders, uh, which were more or less, they, they, they didn't, didn't have really strong initial requirements other than the, that the country needs to develop its own space sector. Obviously there was certain national uh, security requirements and certain things which were associated with, with political desires um, around developing this space strategy. But we went through a validation process and then handed this over to, um, again, for further validation for governmental advisors who then went on to uh, finally submit this or, or um, go through the adoption process. So you could think of that as um, some way of using this new model, except you can't really, because it was a lot closer to another type of systems engineering process, what I would refer to as a fake agile process, because really what we've done from the start is we have created a product. We have, we had, I, what I will show you as a final strategy outline or, or narrative, I have worked as the lead technical expert with, with one of the, the lead consultants or the lead consultants. And from, we, we've had it from the very start, almost the first few weeks we've had this. And then we did go through sprints working with the different stakeholders, primarily governmental stakeholders who commissioned this project to iterate it over and over and over, over again. 
and then finally arrive to product. So it was kind of like an agile process that you see in, in, in software engineering, where you do have a product which you then improve upon through every sprint of an agile process. And there are problems with this. So, you know, this not really being a, an actual V model meant that in some ways the requirements did change because we did have some sort of user story at the start and some sort of uh, idea of, of, of user requirements, but they have evolved over, over, over time. And it was really a learning process for the customers as well. And this does happen because an emerging space nation or an emerging space actor, one of the problems is that many of the stakeholders obviously have not used or are not really familiar with space technologies and initially won't even know that they need this. I've had, I have heard this from, from larger nations as well and, and people who have worked on those strategies in larger, much more developed um, space nations that they themselves weren't, some of their stakeholders weren't really aware of how they're going to use space technology. So as you go through this agile process, some of your stakeholders learn more and more things and you might end up with a final product at which point, which is not entirely what they desired, because at that point, they have a much more developed idea of what their requirements are. They, they learn through the process and you arrive to something at the end and they say, well, you know, this is really good, but could we go back to the start of the process? Because I actually don't really think that even the fundamentals were right. I now understood how I really would have wanted to do this. So this is why they say, and again, I have heard this from others as well in a somewhat unofficial context. And, and, and uh, in, in again, space strategy creation, that this is one of the problems with how in this traditional uh, um, consultancy manner you approach um, stakeholder analysis. You can do it in two ways, and I'm certain that I'm, I myself have worked as a consultant, but I'm not a consultancy expert. I'm certain that this is also theoretical material for many of them. You can approach this in a way that you create a hypothesis and then you test that. And you can also approach it in a way that we have done it, a fully exploratory process, empirical process, in which you go through dozens or hundreds of stakeholders, what we have done, and interview all of them. The problem is you don't really learn much of that, much of it. You do learn what they desire, and, and they sort of learn from you what is available. But for you to weigh things and, and to understand, okay, then what it is that we really have to do, this is not the best process. So ideally, if I were to do it again, and this is going to be part of one of the lessons learned, I would create a hypothesis and then go into testing that. So I would, for example, say that for a small country like this or a relatively small country like this, certainly ambitious and certainly with a really rich history in sciences, I would want to create or, or venture into one orbit servicing. And I would check if the different uh, uh, industry segments that that would rely on exist, and I can use that, rather than going through all of the different actors who exist and, and, and ask them, you know, what have you worked on over the past few years, a few decades, what are you interested in? What do you think you could work on? And again, a reminder of that dy dynamics, because as you create the strategy, you need to remember that certain processes are stronger, certain feedback loops are really strong and they're going to influence your strategy. And again, a reminder of your initial goals and why you have ventured into starting this strategy, because it is only through that that you realize that in some cases, you want to ditch everything that you've learned from the stakeholder analysis. Yes, you want to retain the know-how at any cost because that's going to be really on the edge if you want to compete and, and win certain projects, for example, in the European Space Agency system. So, you know, in the case of Hungary, for example, some one of their largest projects um, in the commercial sector that was won recently is associated with the Lunar Gateway project, where Hungary is going to be actually consortium, consortium, consortium leader in a dosimetric development project. And they have been able to do this because they had years and years, decades of heritage in dosimetric development. But you may not want to also retain the structural approaches and listen to all of the stakeholders when they describe how they would be best want to, to structure their processes. Because if you retain what architecture existed, you're not really leapfrogging. So the issue is that you want to retain the, the know-how, but you also kind of want to ditch some of that what well, is associated with processes. Because if you remember that different, different develop, development curve, one of the benefits of, of emerging space nations is that actually they have gone through, they, they, have, they now have the lessons learned for all the processes that they're, they're, they're trying to adopt. And they can instead focus on how to use those processes and also adopt them for the new um, challenges and then implement the processes first and then focus on the products. So you don't really want to listen, you want to understand your needs and you definitely want to, you need buying from your stakeholders. If you tell your stakeholders that you want to ditch what they've been doing for the past decade or two decades or whatever, 
there's no, but there won't be anybody who uses your strategy. You have written it for your, for your best for her. So you do need buy-in, but you also need to remember that leapfrogging is really only possible if you're skipping certain steps and you're, 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 there, there's a sort of, in a Schumpeterian way, there's a creative destruction. You're creating something new. And then understanding all of this, we have come up with this structural map or narrative. So it did have an initial phase where we focused on bringing things together, creating, strengthening certain links as we understood how this system dynamics um, aspect of, at, at least as I have understood it, um, how certain things relate to one another. And you try to boost the most critical links between parts of your complex system. You try to synchronize the industry. You try to create a supportive environment. If you remember what I've shown earlier, you know, you do, you can influence certain international, uh, at least work with international actors, and, and also within your own country, you can create standards. So you can create a supportive environment, you can create your, inter, your strength and your international presence. So you focus on the, the, the critical elements of your, of the dynamics of this system in which you, as a, sp as a space actor, exist. And then after that, uh, we focus on how we then build on that, on, on in some ways starting this technology road mapping temporal process, and then thinking about how we're going to um, evolve um, our industry and, and build up from what we had a large ecosystem. So we we thought about expanding spin-off models. So having we we did have a lot of academic research institutions who have done some fantastic work and who have done worked on payloads and science payloads with East, uh, European Space Agency country, uh, countries or. The, uh, member states and have worked also with other states, with Russia and, uh, and other countries and NASA projects as well. So we wanted to build on that know-how and actually create, emphasize or, or improve a spin-off model. We also wanted to further build um, synergies, so kind of bring more things into this dy dynamic system and, and create non-existent feedback loops. So Hungary has a fairly developed automotive um, industry and it does work on manufacturing for some of the largest German um, automotive firms. So we wanted to build on those and create loops between uh, or feedback loops between uh, or connections between some of those actors and, and, you know, help some sort of technology transfer internally within the country. Then we also wanted to focus on, on what happens over the next decades, and this is a temporal part. We wanted to understand the challenges and opportunities. This is a data-hungry society. This is going to be, um, you know, um, an industry 4.0 society over the next decades. It is already, it already is. So we wanted to focus on that. And then one of the fundamental things is education. It's really difficult to build your space industry if you don't have anybody to work in it. And obviously this was one of the first things that we faced and, and why it became even more clear that you do need to work on this centrally and you do need to build your, your space industry because you have to retain talent. You have to, you know, Hungary has, um, centuries or certainly decades of, of, of uh, incredible um, STEM education. And Hungary has this dispro uh, disproportionately large number of Nobel laureates. There's a reason for that, but you know, it is true for most of the Central European countries and regions that many of them end up traveling within the, the, the regions or, or you know, within the European Union to other countries and working elsewhere. We wanted to retain them and also build the future and, and, and educate people to actually build up this sector. So once we've closed this gap that we assumed existed between us and other spacefaring nations and moving a little bit further along that capacity, and in some ways the autonomy as well, but primarily the capacity access of that EFDI matrix I've shown earlier, we also wanted to focus on how we become more autonomous. We wanted to, and these were some of the key requirements, if, if you know, these were some of the main requirements that did exist in terms of a political desire, in terms of, you know, from other space actors, uh, sorry, from, from other um, um, actors within the country or, or governmental actors, they did want a geostationary satellite at some point. And certainly there was a desire to have a Hungarian astronaut. And this is going to be the second talk tomorrow that I will talk more about, because this was one of the first projects that, that has started um, taking shape and manifesting, along with the geostationary satellite. So even though we place these um, in, the, in our narrative or in our structure a few years down the line, this is not entirely um, a temporal process going from bottom up, or it's not entirely a, a linear timeline going from bottom up. Those have started already in those projects, and th those were actually key to implementing this strategy. And then finally, this is working more towards on the autonomy axis. We wanted to make sure that eventually 
because it is a relatively small country in, in, in overall GDP terms. We wanted to make sure that this industry that we're creating can become self-sustaining. You know, it's easy and obviously not as easy as, as one or I might say now, it's, it's difficult to get budgetary commitments even within the US towards space research, space science and exploration. But it's much easier if you're, you're the size of the United States and you do have a lot more resources to sustain your space industry over the decades and sustain large projects. This, we didn't think this would be a one-time commitment because certainly as soon as you start building your space industry, some things are set into motion and you have an industry in the system and you don't want to ditch that future governments uh, or you know, this government will continue to support the space industry, but the large commitment might only be happening initially, at least for now. You do want to use that as effectively as you can and create a self-sustaining space industry. So the idea here was to move much more along the autonomy axis and for example, create a, a small satellite integration capacity or capability within the country that can then become self-sustaining and also support nations around us. Now, I want to move on to the lessons learned. I want to move on to what I would do now differently if I were to start this process again. Again, not to offer uh, you know, any sort of blueprints or, or, um, or, or, or exact guidance to anyone venturing into strategy writing or, or, or working in this domain, but merely to, to, you know, to, to, to explain what I would do, what we've learned from this and I would do differently if I were to start again. I've mentioned the stakeholder analysis. I've mentioned how we went through this exploratory process, empirical data and, and analyzed and written uh, dozens of pages, hundreds of pages on the diagnostical side. I think if we were to do it now, the hypothesis approach would probably be more successful. And there was another thing, you know, I borrowed this, um, I hope Professor Crawley doesn't mind, this is one of his excellent lectures. He's one of the foremost experts of space systems engineering um, uh, at MIT restaurant in the world as well. This is from, from, from one of his works. Um, one of his lectures as well, this is a way to map our stakeholder relations. Now, why do I bring this up? Because after we've gone through the strategy writing process and I have spoken to industry um, leaders and, and, have, and people who themselves have worked before and after the strategy as well um, in, in, this, in the Hungarian space industry, one of the things they said that it was great that it was implementation focused from the start and we did think about how to in, in, involve um, existing stakeholders within the country or existing companies working within the country. But we, and, and we, we included a lot of involved, a lot of large state actors and large international organizations. One thing we didn't really think of is how, and you know, certainly I'm to blame for this, after working for five years for the world's or largest, second largest aerospace company, um, and certainly one of the largest, if not the largest in Europe in, in, in space and defense for Airbus, which did act as a prime in a large portion or a really large number of European space agency projects, I should have thought about this, that the space industry functions in a way, at least in the European space agency uh, member states, that you have a large prime, which wins the contract and brings in other suppliers. So what we could have also done is really understand who will be the largest companies and what sort of influence they will have on our projects and map them out and not merely just map out stakeholders, but also understand the relevance and importance of that. So you could create a stakeholder map in which you understand these interactions between the different stakeholders. Again, this is some sort of, if you will, some sort of system dynamics chart. But the key here is that if you overlay this, what is referred to as a Kano analysis, so you overlay what are certain things that you absolutely require in red, what are certain things that are nice to have in orange, or what, and what are certain things that you, know, you could have, but they're not necessary, um, you can understand which are the stakeholder needs that you have to sort of prefer during the process and emphasize during the process. You know, this might sound trivial, but certainly other than going through all of the stakeholder needs and definitely putting the governmental stakeholder needs and a stakeholder needs from the European Space Agency at the top, we could have mapped this out and understood it better and interviewed those participants um, more intensively. Now, obviously, there are other things I would have to do differently um, in terms of the, uh, the design definition as well and the iterative process, and also in, the, in terms of verification. What you have to understand is this, what I mentioned earlier, is that this V model really easily becomes an iterative process. 
And especially, you know, the, the key issue is that it becomes an iterative process at the end of which you can end up with a strategy, which then um, actors could realize, stakeholders within the industry or elsewhere could realize that actually this is, now that they've learned the requirements, this is not what they need. So you do need strong buy-in every uh, you know part of the, every step of the process every few weeks you do need to emphasize how this relates to requirements so you need to really strongly really work really well with your your um, stakeholders and, and constantly link it to requirements budget requirements um, capability um, availabilities and, and and work with your key stakeholders mapped out earlier and check if what you're creating is going to work for them because if not you're really just waving your wand around and you're creating a strategy that is not really going to be used because those different members of the orchestra are just going to do what they know to do best. And again, the frog's back because this was one of the things that we've learned that again, there's, there, there's, there's a paradox here because you do need buy-in, what I mentioned earlier. We also need to ditch certain processes. So you might not want to employ the same process that um, you've used in the case of companies or industry processes for the past 30 years, because, and I'm not saying the industry didn't function because those processes were followed, but certainly it is also not just, it was not just due to a lack of resources. So you, you also need to learn what are the things that you learn from your stakeholders that you need to ditch and recreate the processes and adopt other processes. And then again, the verification process is critical when it's handed over to the government as well. So this is what I mentioned earlier, it probably shouldn't be an agile process. It's not really ideal if you arrive to five, six months of this strategy iteration and you realize that the understanding of requirements have changed on, your, um, on the commissioning side. So that have been some unique outcomes. And I have to say that I'm really proud of what we worked on and I appreciate, and I also appreciate how this, this strategy, which we were really proud of, was in the end implemented and reworked by governmental advisors. Um, but I do find that we have done, even just in the process, some uh, incredible development. Because a lot of the times when you model something, even if you don't actually end up using the quantitative aspect of that, just the modeling process leads to a better understanding. This is understood in design thinking, this is understood in systems engineering as well. So just mapping out, mapping out certain things helped commercial actors to understand which are the key industries that can, could be developed. And immediately as, as we brought these people together in these workshops, some sort of synergy started to happen. So, you know, as you create the strategy, at the end of the day, you might not end up with a final narrative or final blueprint that the government implements in the exact same way, but just by doing this process, you're going through some development. We've definitely built synergies. We've definitely raised awareness of the data hungry future society. And you know, the country has since brought in East uh, Big. Country, the country has brought in a lot of things that have helped, um, you know, to move towards that Industry 4.0 modern technology and, and 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 build a society which which could be self-sustaining. We're certainly less reliant on external actors to 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 um, obtain its data. Um, and most importantly, two of the key projects have already started happening. So instead of just merely buying a geostationary satellite, which in itself is a huge project and the commissioning process can be really complex and can help the nation in many ways, expanding into the domain of telecommunications, becoming a telecommunications provider, both in terms of um, civilian uses, but also potentially dual, dual use, military uses for an entire region, which raises external prestige, which raises, re helps with um, the projection of power, um, national power, and health with sovereignty. Um, not just doing this, the country uh, Hungary went beyond this, and commercial actors have now started working on um, acquiring one of the largest Israeli um, um, geostationary satellite operators. And equally, in terms of launching the first astronaut, and this is what my talk is going to be about tomorrow, and I hope many of you can join, um, Hungary is moving incredibly quickly, has already signed a contract uh, or is in the process of signing a contract on, on um, sending a commercial astronaut, or sending, excuse me, sending an astronaut with a commercial company being in many ways uh, a pioneer in this. And I will talk about more, more about this, but this, the astronaut selection process is now already on its way. Uh, it, the launch is planned for 2024. So 
And we have learned that actually these projects are critical. And I will move on to, excuse me, yeah, I will move on to um, making this industry self-sustaining, the thought of making this industry self-sustaining. In order to build up the self-sustaining industry, you, you actually do need a project which allows for the technology transfer. In Dr. Uh, uh, Wood's uh, work, um, the technology transfer happens through different satellite industry projects, either uh, low Earth orbit satellite or geostationary satellite. Certainly, this was the idea here as well. But we have learned, and, and, and those who have are, who are now leading the astronaut projects called Hunor are now learning that actually a project like this, even though initially it might seem, um, I wouldn't call it an insane undertaking, but certainly a really ambitious one, is crucial to build up your space industry because you do need something around which you can create the technology transfer process. You do need um, something which allows you to, to bring in actors, you know, somehow exert or create leverage working with international powers. It does allow you to, you know, to offer some sort of benefit to a large company, a prime who would then come to your country and work with you and, and build a large consortium um, for, for, for winning ESA contracts. You do need a large project with, with commitment, and that allows you to, to gradually grow your self-sustaining industry. The astronaut project in Hungary will lead to, uh, and, and I'm certain about this, will lead to the, the involvement of a large number of, of smaller companies now developing experiments for the Hungarian astronauts and then using, using this experience to, to grow their technology readiness level and bid for other projects and not nearly uh, acquire the invaluable know-how of training an astronaut and developing an astronaut mission, but also expanding that and using that in other domains of the space industry. And, and Hungary is now on the map of the global space industry and space ecosystem. So it will, this is a way to make it self-sustaining. Now, I wouldn't want to use this as a comparison. I would merely say, I don't want to compare the Hungarian strategy to the British strategy, entirely different contexts, the UK is certainly not an emerging space sector, but I did look at it when it came out, and I was really proud to say that, you know, even though I sat down to this thinking that I will have to fake it till I make it, and, and they had probably made a mistake selecting me uh, to work on the technology side of this as a technology expert in this, we have done an okay job. You do have in the British uh, space um, national space strategy as well elements we which we have seen in our strategy as well, which we, have, which we have gone through. Now, I understand that certainly some of these are intuitive, but I also recognize that my British colleagues are, you know, many of them certainly much more experienced in this. And we have seen the temporal elements, you have seen, you know, how they think about what we refer to as closing the gap and gaining an edge, the sort of timeline or technology roadmap for themselves. Again, they have iterated, or, or sorry, they have um, uh, um, expressed certain goals and certain steps, how they want to uh, re reach that. What I haven't presented in, in the discussion of the Hungarian National St Space Strategy was the implementation plan, which was contributed in many ways by the governmental advisors who were also privy to and had a, had a good understanding of what sort of resources and funding is available. And they have helped us to create the actual implementation part or, or plan for the strategy. But you know you do have some of the critical steps of how you will achieve the goals, which do resemble what we had on each of the different levels of the strategy, each of the different pillars. And talking of speaking of pillars, you know again they have understood how you need to create the or build up the enabling industries the same ways as we did. And in some ways you can think of this as again understanding the key dynamics within the system. I don't know if they did it in the same sort of semi or whatever scientific way as I've done it, but I can see that, you know, some signs of understanding this or, or understanding these links or, or connections the same way as I did or we did. And as we're coming on to um, 11.30 and I want to leave some time for questions, I wanted to make some concluding remarks. Again, I know I've said this multiple times now, this is not a blueprint. This is not something I would say to other countries to do themselves. Because that's the point, you know, you don't need to understand your local context, you need to understand the dynamics in your own system. So you, I can't say to you that you need to go through, this is why I haven't shown really explicit steps in great detail in our strategy recommendation, because that will depend on your local context. What you should do, on the other hand, is understand the dynamics in your own system, understand how you can view this as a complex system with 
nonlinear feedback loops and which are the key dynamic loops or which are the key feedback uh, loops which you can strengthen and which you need to pay attention to. Yes, certainly there are a few advices I would give in addition to having a holistic thinking and having a system thinking when you build something as complex as a space agency or a space industry or a space strategy. And I would like to emphasize here the reason why this is going to essentially need a systems engineering thinking is because there's obviously Conway's law, which many people are familiar with, that your organization's uh, structure is going to be reflected in your product. I believe it sort of works vice versa as well. In order to have a successful space system or an industry that develops space systems, which are some of the most complex systems in the world in terms of any product that humanity makes, um, you do need to have an industry or, or a strategy that is engineered with that sort of um, systems understanding in mind. You know, if, you, if you're designing a spacecraft, this is why systems engineering originates from aerospace engineering. You have to understand how the different subsystems interact with one another. And the systems engineer's role is monitoring all of the budgets, the cost, the mass, and the power budget, and also monitoring the interfaces and, and going through that systems engineering process I had showed earlier, whether that's a V model process, whether that's an agile process, but keeping track of things of how different things, how different subsystems work with one another. And you do need a central coordinator for that. You certainly need this. And you know, one might ask if you already have a working um, space industry, such as in the case of the UK, why do you need the space strategy? Now, you know, certainly you do need to express some um, global, some overall political goals, and you can use this for prestige and other reasons as well. But also, um, there are certain agreements for which you do need governmental support. In the case of Hungary, for example, if you want to bring in one of the large crimes, you need to offer something in exchange. You do need these bilateral, multilateral agreements. So yes, you do need a systems understanding of this and you need to coordinate things as a systems engineer. So yes, you will. You, it's inevitable to have this holistic systems thinking. And I do think that the systems engineering processes or tools that I've shown earlier help this and help to keep you in check and help to keep track of this process. If I could offer you any key takeaways from this, um, I think, Understanding your stakeholders and some of the invisible ones as well, who will only appear during the implementation process potentially, is critical, but more important is to understand their actual influence. And think of that stakeholder map that I've shown earlier and try to map out whether ones you can sort of neglect and whether ones that in addition to your governmental um, um, stakeholder who have most likely commissioned this project, um, there are also not just your internal industry leaders, but external industry leaders that you need to work with. And you need to understand that in the future, it's most likely going to be Airbus, Thales Linear Space, or one of these large European companies that you're going to work for or with, either as a prime, as it fortunately happened in the case of Union Gateway, or, or as a consortium leader, or as you know, some sort of supplier or subcontractor. You be, need to be able to work with your government to bring these actors in and, and be able to ask them that, okay, well, you can set up a factory here, you can set up something here, it can benefit you in terms of geo returns. All we ask for this is that you, that you use our supplier. So yeah, you need to map this out in, in an even more structured way that, than we have done it. And then finally, yes, um, you know, leapfrogging should be leapfrogging in some cases, you do need to ditch certain processes. And then lastly, major projects, even though they might seem, and I'm certain that, you know, there have been a number of articles in, in different branches or, or, or parts of, of the Hungarian media about how, you know, why does the country need an astronaut? Why does the country need a geostationary satellite? It is because it is really difficult to build up um, your industry if you don't have a major project around which you build it up on. You need this level of commitment. You can't just say that, okay, well, we're going to contract uh, with Airbus, for example, and make a, a bilateral agreement that if they bring, bring in something or an MOU, sign an MOU, they bring in something, um, and we can set up a, a factory over that. We're able to, to, you know, all we're asking is that you help us boost our TRL levels. Then in itself is too vague. You do need some sort of project that you can build with this around. And also the final thing that I haven't put here is that in the end, we ended up with a strategy, which, uh, which I think is going to help hum to put Hungary on the, the global space industry map, and also to hopefully become at least a regional leader. Um, but what we didn't end up with is a national space agency. So we don't yet have one, but I do think that actually that's in some ways the better outcome because we have learned 
that the best thing that you can do is that you build up your experience because you, you're creating, you're one of those developing or emerging nations which has your process first. You don't have your product yet. So, you know, you implement the processes, but you do wait until you have enough experience in your industry to create your national space agency. And in, in some sense, then that shouldn't be level zero, at least part of it should be on level one, level two. So I think this is it from me for today. I hope I was able to, in addition to some anecdotal things, I was able to offer you some ways of thinking or approaching this in a new way or, or a different way to what you may not have thought about before. Um, I'm obviously really proud and privileged and grateful to um, all of those who have um, allowed me to, to, to join this project. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hoping that you can join me tomorrow and, and we can talk about uh, Hunor, um, the Hungarian National Astronaut Program, which I do think is, is, is a major and, and fantastic undertaking in many ways. And yes, I do hope that in five or 10 years from now, we're going to talk, be talking about Hungarian satellites or Hungarian um, AIT or, or a small satellite integration industry. And we'll see it up there with, with some of the nations which did manage to do this, Lithuania and some other countries. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for joining me today. And um, I can see that there are at least two questions. Um, if you have any other questions, um, feel free to post in the Q&A, but um, you can also send it to me after this presentation. I'm, I'm hoping that um, I will be able to engage. I've seen some, um, uh, many of you have signed up from around the world. I, I'm hoping that I can engage with you and discuss this uh, topic. I see that there's a question. Um, you touched on what an emerging space sector is, but what are some telltale signs that a new space sector has emerged? What milestones or metrics make them no longer emerging? I'm curious how you think about that. So um, again, I didn't want to bring in too much of the framework from, from, um, from Harding, where I've, I've taken some of the theoretical background from on how they class different emerging space sectors. I can briefly allude to this. I would recommend they have a, a what I, I found to be an interesting book on uh, space policy for developing, I think it's space policy for, policy for developing nations. Uh, the book was written in uh, 2012 uh, by Robert Harding, and they use uh, some sort of a classification system to, to class the different emerging nations, um, going from tier one, some of the largest countries, which have some of them since you know writing this book or publishing this book have already moved on to becoming a major space power. But you know these countries, tier ones would have the range of launch capabilities. If you think of the ESPI matrix, and again, I can only recommend the ESPI study as well. And I'm hoping that uh, some of my colleagues from, from our colleagues from ESPI are here because that was also a brilliant publication in this with that matrix I've shown earlier. So if you think of a tier one um, emerging nation or space sector, that's all, it's almost already in the, the established space power. They have their own launch capabilities. They have their own uh, almost completely autonomous manufacturing industry, and they do invest a large portion in this. Yes, you can think of these, um, this framework or these, I don't know, different categories in terms of financial, in financial terms as well, what percentage of their GDP they're, they're spending on it. But again, it really comes down to what level of autonomy and what level of capacity they have. So I would say an emerging space, space nation or space actor stops or ceases become to, to ceases to be an emerging space sector or a space sector when it's fully autonomous, I think. Yes, you, you know, some might argue that the, the UK, which didn't have its own launch capability, hopefully this year they will have it. Um, there are plans to launch from the Shetland Islands, but you could argue that that wasn't emerging space nation, and, and I would agree with that. Uh, and that was a, a space power without a launch capability. So. This is why these definitions are, I didn't want to include too much of that because I, I don't think that you can shoehorn everything into these categories. But I would say that once it has a great deal of autonomy and, and, and certainly capacity to build its own satellite and almost every component and also integrate it, which is pretty cool, um, then you, you, you've moved on to become a space power. And the other thing is that how you use this. Um, so for, for, for some of the, the, the larger space powers, um, the space power that they have is also part of what people, some people refer to as critical nat national uh, power. So it is part of how they, they act in international politics. They exert their influence in the space domain um, to, to, to work with other international actors um, in, in other domains of diplomacy. So it really is part of their uh, you know, key national strategic I don't remember the exact thing from, I think, Milton Friedman, but the, the sort of strategic national asset 
Um, so that I think that's the point where you see to be uh, an emerging state actor or space actor. The other question is most emerging space nations don't have the same rich history of scientific discovery that Hungary does. Most didn't send an astronaut of their own to space in the 60s or 70s, but does that really matter? How did this heritage affect the process of writing Hungary's national space strategy? Now, I would say that having been involved in, in um, for example, uh, the, in the Intercosmos program uh, and, you know, uh, Bertrand and Farkas flying and also preparing other astronauts such as Vila Magyari, uh, who's, it, it, you know, this is where this comes into play. For example, Vila Magyari's son, who is, um, uh, you know, a, a brilliant um, um, flight trainer and is now working on the, the operational side uh, of the, the, the National Astronaut Program has had, was exposed to this. So certainly count the dosimetry experiments, for example, that have helped uh, Hungarian uh, companies to win the Lunar Gateway project or a large, sorry, uh, the dosimetry uh, project of the Lunar Gateway um, definitely linked to that. So it, it just creates some level of heritage. But, you know, for example, to, from what I understand, India has had I, okay, I don't want to. I don't want to say anything silly. I don't have exact information, but many of the large space actors didn't, or space powers didn't have the restaurants, and it didn't really matter for them. What really matters is that that is one way to one way to gain heritage, and this is also a reason why, for example, Hunor um, can be critical to building up um, technology or, or you know helping technology transfer and building up your space domain. So it's, it's, it's not a vanity project, it's, you know, it, it's, it's just the true, same thing is true for Intercosmos or that Soviet uh, program which allowed in exchange for certain, if I remember correctly, certain um, trade deals uh, to, to allow for, for uh, Hungarian and, and many uh, um, other states in the region to fly uh, on uh, Soviet spacecraft. It created an opportunity to build up at least one or two critical technologies, then that could be used, which, which could then be used later on for creating the space industry. So I would say it isn't critical. You don't have to have an astronaut. But you think about uh, you know, the UK, for example. Um, the um, apologies, I, I wanted to say her name too quickly. Um, I, I do apologize, you didn't lose my name, but they, they, the country did have an astronaut who flew in, in another cycle program, if I remember correctly, somewhat similar to, if not into Cosmos, Helen Shannon, yes. Um, so she's flown, um, you know, back in the 1980s, 70s, 80s. Uh, but up to that point, the UK did have a decent amount of involvement in the space industry, certainly had its missile industry, certainly had, actually what many don't know is that the Ariane launches were literally developed, developed from a UK missile te or test missile, and then um, handed over to um, France to, to develop that further. So they did have a really strong space domain, and yet they had Helen Sherman and one astronaut up to a certain point. And beyond that, they didn't have an astronaut until Team Peak came along, uh, which again, however, became a critical, uh, you know, a, a hugely influential project for them. Um, I've had uh, some uh, wonderful chats with um, uh, Libby Jackson, who coordinated the, the human space flight missions uh, or mission um, in the UK. And there, there, there's also a great report on how it will impact the country's STEM uh, in the, or STEM sector and education and, and, and industry over the coming decades. So you don't have to have it. They didn't have it for quite a while. And then they had one astronaut, as opposed to, you know, France has had quite a few astronauts uh, flying with the European, European Space Agency, but it does help building this space heritage. Um, I don't know if there are other, any other chats or oh, sorry, questions. Um, so um, I'm going to stay for another few minutes. If anybody has any questions, I don't know from the audience here. I have a question. Thomas. Maybe I can be heard on the mic, but maybe you can repeat the question. But it's about, if you want to send a human to space, currently there's only three options to do that. Um, launching from a U.S. spacecraft on U.S. soil, a Russian spacecraft on Kazakh soil, or a Chinese spacecraft on Chinese soil. And just in and of itself, there's so much strategy in pursuing any of those options or writing any of them off. Can you share the Hungarian perspective and that strategy of writing any of them off if you did that? Okay, so uh, the question from Thomas was, let me repeat it. So the question was that, 
Um, at the moment, to fly an astronaut to space, there are three real options to this. One is to fly with Russia, one is to fly with the United States, and, and I'm hoping, I don't know if that's really available to many other nations, but to fly with China. Physically, Physically yes. Well, so these are the space faring nations in the sense that they have their own launches. Um, and the question from Thomas was, as you create the strategy for this, how do you write off or how do you do your, your I would say decision process or trace space exploration, whatever. In this case, I would say decision process of ruling out some of the other options. Now, I repeated this question, but now I'm going to uh, leave you with a cliffhanger because I'm hoping that you can join tomorrow where we discuss some of this. Um, I do have to say that I wasn't privy to the entire process. Um, I was fortunate to talk to um, some of the coordinators of this project. So I'm hoping I can share what I found to be an excellent and, and, and frankly, really smart approach to this and how they have come to the decision to work with actually a US company, but a commercial actor. And they have been able to leverage, or Hungary has been able to leverage the opportunity that now you can fly commercial astronauts, for example, with Axiom Space. You can fly them to the International Space Station and they're going to be much more than space tourists. You're, you, this is the beginning of commercial um, astronaut programs. And Hungary, in my understanding, is a pioneer in this, and it is going to lead in many ways to the, the democratization of space. So I don't know if there are other questions. Um, I think it's 10 to. Um, I don't think that there are many sweat unanswered questions. So with that, I think I, I wanted to thank everybody who joined today again. And um, this, uh, from what I understood, this has been recorded. And um, once, once it has gone through the, the process of uh, validating it and, and ensuring that it, it um, complies with all of the MIT requirements, uh, I'm hoping that we can have this uh, published and um, it will be available uh, for viewing later on. So thank you again uh, to all of you joining. and. Dr. Whedon, thank you so much. Um, it was a privilege to have uh, this uh, or give this talk with you. And I really look forward to join working with uh, Professor Jeff Hoffman tomorrow and to talk about astronaut programs in emerging space nations and in Hungary. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for coming. Dr. Whedon, I don't know if you. Oh, okay. Um, Sweden is up. Okay, thank you.